Hi, everybody. My name is Rafa Lombardino, and this is Translation Confessional. How I Learned Italian In episodes 6 and 23, I talked about how I learned English and Spanish, respectively my second and third languages. Today, I'll wrap up this How I Learned series with Italian, my fourth language. Despite my very Italian name, Raffaella Lombardino, my Italian roots are a little further up my family tree. My last name is my married name, so you can blame my husband for that. He's a third-generation American from Sicilian great-grandparents on his father's side. On my side of the family, I got to meet my great-grandmother, who was a first-generation Brazilian from Neapolitan parents, born in the turn of the 20th century, when a wave of Italian immigrants went looking for a better life in Brazil taking the long journey by ship and arriving in my hometown, Santos, in the state of Sao Paulo. Now, the story I heard about my great-grandmother's father, the one who went to Brazil from Naples, is that his name was Scarpini, and he arrived in the country as a young kid, nine or ten, I believe. Once again, This is what I was told by my grandma about her own grandpa, and I have no way to actually verify the story. But it seems that the boy was sort of kidnapped by his friend's family. The Scalpini boy came from a poor Neapolitan family, and his friend came from a better-off family that was planning to move to Brazil and open a business there. Because the boys were very close, They took my great-great-grandfather with them on that long journey. As a grown man, Grandpa Scarpini got very ill and said he had to return back home and see his mother one last time. He managed to travel to Naples and reunite with his elderly mother, being cured miraculously of what could have been a serious case of a broken heart. So, Italian was always very present in my life, but I never got to formally study it at a language school. Unlike what happened with Spanish, which was driven by the Mercosur trade bloc and motivated teenage students like me to learn the language in the 1990s, Italian has always been the one language many Brazilians, especially in the southern part of the country, feel very connected to because of our history. However, It isn't a language you can have easy access to within the school system, and few language schools offered Italian classes, at least back in my day. Growing up, there always seemed to be Italian-adjacent characters in the soap operas I watched as a kid. They mixed some Italian words with an accent that I can only imagine would be considered a little offensive by actual people from Italy, but it was all well-intentioned. These characters were always the life of the party, extroverts who owned an Italian restaurant that served as a backdrop for a subplot. That somewhat changed in 1999 when there was an entire soap opera dedicated to the Italian immigration wave that had taken place one century earlier. In Terra Nostra, Brazilian actors didn't speak entire dialogues in Italian but there was a more serious tone to the historical plot. About a decade later, in 2010, Passione showed Italian immigrants in Brazil in modern times. And it seems that some of the Brazilian actors were praised by Italians for their pronunciation, which resulted in some Italian expressions being made more mainstream in Brazilian vocabulary. I also grew up with traditional Italian music being played in the background. Yes. Fonicoli, Fonicola, and Volare were part of the best hits my dad brought home on those music CD collections that came with a Sunday newspaper sometimes. But it was only in 1993 that a song in Italian really piqued my curiosity. 
It was Cosa della Vita by Eros Ramazzotti. I was able to listen to that song time and time again because it was one of the themes to a Brazilian soap opera. Surprise, surprise. And I had a vinyl for the international soundtrack. However, you won't believe how hard it was for me to actually find a copy of Eros' CD. You see, whenever Italian singers cross the Atlantic, their music would be actually marketed in Spanish. I mean, Brazil is the only country in Latin America that speaks Portuguese, so all we had was Spanish versions of Italian pop music in the 90s. That's when Eros Ramazzotti, Laura Pausini, and Gianluca Gagnani became famous in Latin America. Actually, kudos to Laura Pausini, because she doesn't sing in Spanish phonetically, like many of her peers. She is completely fluent in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, too. Still, I wanted to listen to more pop music in Italian, but was only able to find that Edo CD about two years later, and it had a hefty price tag since it was imported straight from Italy. When I moved to the United States, I was able to diversify my musical taste and got to listen to Lorenzo Giovanotti, Carmen Consoli, Giuseppe Ferreri, Noemi, and my favorites, Tiziano Ferro and Negramaro. Actually, Negramaro was my personal soundtrack to our month-long backpacking adventure through Italy in 2007. I'll tell you more about that experience and how we found family in Sicily right after this. Before we continue, I wanted to tell you a bit about Audio Converter Pro. It comes in handy when I receive audio files from clients who need transcription services. Sometimes they may send me an audio in an odd format, so I can convert it to MP3 and load it to my transcription software to get things going. And because I also do voiceovers, I can use it to edit audio and convert clips according to the client's specifications. Especially when converting audio files in batch because a client forgot to tell me beforehand that they needed it in WAV instead of MP3, for example. So I can select all the clips and boom, convert it. Done. If you'd like to give Audio Converter Pro a try, go to this webpage, bit.ly slash tc dash ac. It's easy to remember. TC is for Translation Confessional and AC is for Audio Converter. Once again, the webpage is bit.ly slash tc dash ac. Hope you like it. So in 2007, my husband and I had saved enough money to fulfill a lifelong dream. Visit Italy. He grew up hearing his grandpa talk about how he had learned from his parents about the motherland. But Grandpa Lombardino never had a chance to visit Italy. So there we went, one last trip before we started a family. I studied a lot on my own in preparation for the trip. I needed to structure all my scattered knowledge in Italian in order to try to communicate well, especially if we were going to look for family there. A couple of days before we left, I called my father-in-law to pinpoint exactly where his family came from in Sicily. He had a copy of his own father's birth certificate, the first Lombardino to be born in the United States, which indicated where his parents had been born. My father-in-law started to spell the name of the city. J-I-B... I stopped him right there. Dad, there's no J in the Italian alphabet. Isn't it a G? He insisted it was a J, and I wrote down a G anyway. The town we would have to find was called Gibellina. We researched the area, traced our itinerary, got our train passes, and there we went. We wandered through the streets of Rome... Florence, Naples, Genoa, Venice, Pisa, Bologna, one of our favorites, and Milan, of course, since my husband is a huge AC Milan fan and we had to go to one of their games. Then we went down to Palermo in Sicily. We actually flew there and took a cab to the hotel, where we'd spend the night before getting on a train to Gibellina. We still talk about that cab ride to this day. 
It was us and another couple of tourists waiting outside the airport, trying to figure out how to get to the hotel in the middle of the night. A cab driver approached us and said that for 40 euros, he could take us there. That sounded about right. 20 euros per couple, and we were going in the same direction anyway. We all got in. The older gentleman sat in the front. His wife, my husband, and I got in the back. Once on the road, the cab driver requested payment. We gave him 20, and the older gentleman gave him 20. The driver started rattling off, requesting more money. Am I broken Italian? Because... I understand it well, but I don't think in the language as fluently as I do in English. I told the driver that he said 40 euros, and he got his 40 euros. I remember as if it were yesterday. He turned to me when he should be looking at the road and said that it was 40 euros each couple, or he would just leave us right there in the middle of the freeway in the middle of the night. I explained it to the other couple in English, and we both parted ways with 40 euros, so the driver could get his 80 euros for that short ride to the hotel. Anyway, the next day we were excited to take the train to Gibellina and try to find some paperwork about the Lombardinos. Well, I should say Lombardini, right? We almost missed our stop, and a nice old man on the train told us we had to jump off at the incoming station a few meters ahead if we didn't want to miss the little town completely. It seems that the train just slowed down a bit, and we literally had to hop off, you know, because nobody else was making that stop, just my husband and me, and we would have indeed missed it if we blinked. It must have been about 1 p.m. or so when we arrived, and it started drizzling. It looked like a ghost town because, as we later found out, everyone was hanging out indoors with family after lunch. My husband and I wandered around the streets, trying to find the one bed and breakfast we had researched. Keep in mind, smartphones and mobile GPS apps were in their infancy back in 2007. In the distance, we finally saw someone else on the street. My husband and I got goosebumps right away because that man looked exactly like his father. Well, at least it looked like we were in the right place after all. We found one convenience store that was open and I decided to try our luck. I asked the shopkeeper if she knew where the bed and breakfast was and she said the owner was her friend so she could give her a call. Soon, an older lady showed up and drove us to her B&B. It was just a couple of minutes away because the city is indeed small. On our brief car ride, I asked her if she knew where we could find city records. I explained we came from the United States and were looking for documentation on the Lombardino family. Lombardino? Li conosco. Ho una amica che si chiama Lombardino, the woman said. Once in her duplex, she called her friend Nini, who showed up and was a little skeptical at first when she heard our story. She told us Lombardino was a very popular name in the region, and she was actually a Lombardino on both sides of the family. She explained that her mother and father were not related, that they came from two different Lombardino families, and their union had been approved by the church after some extensive research into their respective family trees. I told her what I knew about my husband's family, and she asked if we wanted to come over to her house, because she had some pictures of her family members from the United States. Maybe we could identify someone. Once at her place, she broke out all the family pictures and called her husband Nicola and their children Tiziana and Alex, who came downstairs. Nini showed us a picture of her dad's cousin, who had been born in the United States. My husband recognized his own grandpa in the picture right away. No, Nini said, that's my dad's cousin. (laughs) My husband insisted that it was his grandpa. And you can see he was missing a finger. He was a mechanic, occupational hazard. My husband recognized the belt buckle he was wearing too. I asked Nini how she got a picture of Grandpa Paul, and she explained that almost one year earlier to that exact date, in October 2006, Penny had arrived in Jibelina looking for her family roots. Penny was Paul's niece, my father-in-law's first cousin. My husband hadn't met his dad's extensive Lombardino family in Louisiana. Grandpa Paul was one of eight or nine children, I believe. As we looked through the pictures, we found one of Penny's wedding day, and I started tearing up. She looks just like my sister-in-law, I said. 
My husband agreed. When she was younger, Penny looked a lot like his own sister. Nini realized we were all family indeed, and she started calling everyone to share the news. With the exception of Nini, the rest of the family is called Barbiera now. Not Lombardino anymore due to an aunt's name change when she got married, I guess. Soon, cousin Mimo showed up. Nini said Mimo had lived in Texas when he was younger. Mimo started up an animated conversation with me. I remember thinking, I must be so tired or overwhelmed with joy because I can't quite understand what he's saying. All I could get from that story about Mimo in Texas was that it was in the 1970s and there was a horse in it somehow. Minnie then came back to where we were sitting and smacked him on the back of the head and said, Speak Italian to her. She won't understand Sicilian. <laughs> well, then it made sense why I was having such a hard time following the story. The next day, we went to Ninetta's house. She was an older cousin who had family records. She found a letter from great-grandpa Vincenzo Lombardino, Paul's father, who rode back home in the early 1900s with news that he had become an American citizen. His naturalization paper showed a man who looked a lot like Paul, and my husband Vincent got to see a picture of whom he had been named after. Now, one last story about Jubilina. The city we got to visit, unfortunately, was not the same town where great-grandpa Lombardino was born. Old Jibelina was flattened out by an earthquake in 1968. Until the early 1980s, displaced families lived in barracks until Jibelina Nuova was rebuilt further down the mountain. Cousin Tiziana got to drive us up there, and it is an incredible sight. Where every house and shop once stood, you can now see big concrete blocks, some of them almost six feet tall. That way, the families could still walk through the streets of their old town and remember where they grew up. We loved spending time with our long-lost cousins in Jubilina, and we got to learn more about the family history, their daily lives, their occupations, stories about men hunting for quail after a few drinks. Cousin Lilia took us to a local museum and to have some gelato in the next town. Nicola and Nini showed us the ruins in Selenunte nearby. On our last day in Jubilina, we got to have pizza with the entire family at a local restaurant, and there were some tears. Well, at least from my part and some of the ladies my age. I remember Nini asking, is Vincent happy he found us? And I said, of course, look at his face. He was beaming from ear to ear because that's the only way he knew how to show his excitement after having realized his grandpa's dream. So, after these long, nostalgic stories, all I can say is that I've learned Italian more with my heart than with my mind. I translate from Italian to Portuguese and English because I can properly relay the message into my two languages but I'm not as fluent in it as I would have liked. I still have to double-check a lot of spelling and verb conjugations when communicating with someone in Italian, especially for business. But I've noticed that I can let my hair down much better when speaking Italian with family because even though I don't have an internal monologue in Italian, I can always speak to them from my heart. Send me an email at rlombardino at wordawareness.com or leave a voice message on my anchor page. If I get enough feedback and voice messages, I can go back to the subject and post a special podcast episode with everyone's opinion on this very same theme. By the way, my anchor page is anchor.fm slash translation dash confessional. I look forward to hearing from you. Stay tuned for weekly episodes and subscribe to Translation Confessional through your favorite podcast app.